Hi, Passwords Con 2021. This is Christian Brand here. Um, I'm a product manager at Google. And about three years ago, I did a very similar talk in Sweden at Passwords Con uh, around the features of FIDO and what we're working on and what's coming. Um, today is a slightly similar presentation. Um, again, we're going to be looking at some of the reasons why we're doing the work we're doing. Um, and we're also going to be looking at the remaining uh, kind of gaps in the FIDO specification and in WebAuthn and the things we're working on over the next 12 to 18 months to truly make this technology um, a all-around password replacement. Um, things were a little different three years ago. I think a lot of the stuff that um, you know we, we were discussing at that point were kind of like bare basic things. Uh, most of those are now solved. Most of those are implemented. And um, what remains really are kind of like the finishing touches um, on the specification. Also, one can kind of like see a change here in, um, in the way that the program is also structured, where I think back in 2018, I was the only presentation on FIDO. Uh, things were mostly around passwords and password managers and other kind of features to help users manage their kind of like online identity better. Um, whereas this year, um, I'm seeing a lot more interest and a lot more presentations and talks uh, about FIDO and, and WebAuthn directly. So I think that's signaling good things. Um, I think that tells us that there is a lot more interest in the technology and the things we've been building and the things we've been talking about is resonating with industry. But really, this talk today is about those last couple of gaps that remains and how we as an industry are working to, towards solving those. So with that, why don't we uh, we jump straight in? So this is similar to a slide that I've shown uh, three years ago. Also, I think the trend lines are trending very, very similarly. Um, we basically saw in 2015 that phishing on the web was starting to surpass malware. Um, and, and really, that has only been kind of like increasing ever since. Um, one of the things that we are seeing here is that it is just so easy for bad actors on the web to trick users into revealing usernames and passwords and even multi-factor OTP codes and you know web approvals or mobile approvals. Like the, these these technologies that we've developed in order to try and and, and uh, guard against phishing is is kind of like nice stop gaps but in general they're not solving the real problem um where where, where bad actors as we know gets online gets username get password you know tricky into also revealing otp codes or whatever and at that point in time they've got everything needed to to essentially break into your online account and, and perform account takeover um and and we've kind of like seen malware kind of completely drop by the wayside i mean malware is tricky uh, avs and built-in uh operating system uh, technologies are, are becoming better at dealing with kind of like unwanted software. Uh, and as such, like bad guys on the internet have really started to, to uh, um, I guess, exploit the, the easiness and the low hanging fruit nature of phishing more and more. Um, and, and it doesn't really look like it's, it's, it's you know, going to stop anytime soon. Um, and that's really the reason why we got involved in FIDO from a Google perspective in the first place, or at this point, almost a decade ago, um, it was kind of because we saw this worrying trend. Um, and, and what we'll do here today is we'll kind of like look briefly again at some of the basic building blocks of FIDO, but really we're going to be looking at those things that hopefully places FIDO on a route um, to, to kind of like full password replacement here over time. So basically, kind of about 10 years ago, we looked at this problem and we said, hey, we have to figure out some way to solve this. Uh, we don't only want to solve it for our company. We want to solve this holistically for the industry. And we came up, of course, with with, with FIDO and with uh, uh, WebAuthn. Uh, WebAuthn came a little bit later. It kind of like became the standard. We'll look at that in a future slide. But essentially, WebAuthn uh, is a W3C specification that, of course, allows websites to interact with authenticators or specifically FIDO authenticators. And the way that things kind of like hang together, and again, I, I showed a version of this slide a couple of years ago, kind of like there is a remote server uh, there is a client, which is typically a computer or a phone, running a browser maybe, definitely running some OS. Um, and, and there is a protocol between the remote server and the client. And that protocol um, is essentially from the website. It's W3C WebAuthn. 
Um, and if it's a native app running on the device, then it might be kind of like a similar version of the protocol. But in essence, if you're if you're a web developer and you want to implement Fido, that's the protocol to take a deep look at. Um, of course, you can take a look at the specification directly on the web. We also have some uh, more simplified, and I think some some kind of like thorough use case documentation, which I'll reference a little bit later in the in the talk. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. And then, of course, on the left hand side. Um, we have a protocol that lives wholly inside of the FIDO Alliance. It's called CTAP, the Client to Authenticator Protocol. And the Client to Authenticator Protocol is essentially a protocol that um, it just defines the interface between a computer, a phone, a browser, operating system, and removable authenticators. Uh, those are the physical security keys, right? These things that, you know, we've... Uh, We've come to, to to kind of know and love physical security keys that you're using in order to authenticate uh, uh, um, in, into services, mainly as a second factor. Nowadays, some of these can also be used as password replacements, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but essentially, unless you're a, um, a, a, a company um, or an institution interested in developing these physical authenticators, then the CTAP protocol is probably not something that, that you need to focus on. That's really between the authenticator and the client. And then lately, what's even more interesting is these built-in authenticators. So um, we kind of knew that if we want FIDO to be successful, we can't really rely on users going out and all buying physical security keys. Uh, what, what we really want is we want users to have these authenticators built into the platforms they already own. Um, and that took us a while, but essentially we were able to implement built-in authenticator, FIDO authenticators into Android. So all Android devices from 7 or N onwards have built-in authenticator uh, for FIDO in, in, in the OS. Um, and then also uh, lately other, other uh, platform providers like Windows, Microsoft has Windows Hello, which is a, a FIDO authenticator built into the platform. And then also iOS and Mac OS, which now has FIDO authenticators directly built into the platform. And all of those are accessible through the W3C WebAuthn API which we'll look at in, in, in a little bit more detail. Um, also, CTAP protocol today defines the standard or the specification for communicating between a, a laptop desktop or a, or a browser or a machine and a physical security key. Um, we're also working on extending that, as we'll see later, to kind of communicate from the laptop also to other external authenticators like mobile phones. But, but we'll get to that in, in, in due course here today. So that's kind of like how things hang together. And then, of course, as an umbrella term, we refer to this whole uh, system essentially we refer to as FIDO2. So all these various components kind of fit in under this umbrella of, of FIDO2. So we've come a really long way. Um, you know, U2F, universal second factor, where I use a physical security key in order to authenticate um, into a system in like a phishing resistant way. Um, that's kind of where we started. And I, I spoke a lot about that in, in, in the, uh, the previous discussion about three years ago, because that's kind of like where we were at that point in time. We were, we were keeping our eye on the future, uh, bringing in like how can users use the devices they already own. But at that point, physical security keys and physical authenticators were still the, the, the main kind of like deployment of, of FIDO online. Um, what we've recently done is we've brought this concept of platform authenticators into FIDO as well. So your mobile phone, your desktop, your laptop can now become your FIDO authenticator because it has everything built in. Um, and what we're starting to work on now um, is these concepts of discoverable credential support and also kind of like full lifecycle uh, password replacement. Um, and, and we'll go into more details about what that means. But that's kind of like the next uh, order of, of, of things we need to solve. So WebAuthn originally, uh, WebAuthn specification level one kind of covered the, uh, um, the, the, the basics. Level two added some additional kind of support on top of that, like support for enterprises and other things. And then WebAuthn, W3C WebAuthn specification level three is where we're at right now, which is kind of like looking at what are the gaps between what we've done so far, where we are today with FIDO deployment and what's possible, and what are the final things we need to try and solve in order to truly make WebAuthn a replacement for the password and not just an alternative convenience mechanism, um, as so many biometric technologies have become over the years, right? If you imagine I have an application running on my phone, um, you know, I can authenticate to the app using a username and a password, and maybe I can also authenticate using a biometric, but whenever I change my device, I always fall back to using a password yet again. And that's kind of like what we mean with, with full lifecycle support. 
We want users to upstep into the web of N world and they never have to fall back to passwords ever again. And that's easier said than done, but in the rest of the deck, we're gonna look at mechanisms um, and ideas we have for, for really moving, moving to that world. So as I said, first there was U2F, universal second factor. Um, it's an incredibly important protocol in the fight against phishing. And that's really what got Google involved in WebAuthn and Fido in the first place, right? And the flow goes something like this. I go to a website, I type a username, I type a password, I'm being asked to insert my security key, I click a button, and at that point in time, I'm signed in. And, and what makes this different from other forms of second factors is that with the U2F uh, protocol, not only am I sending a signature of like, you know, essentially proving that I have access to a private key to the server, but the server is also proving its authenticity to me. And it's doing it in a very simple way, right? It's literally just looking at what the browser is connected to and kind of like sending a hash of the of, of, of the, the web origin to the security key so it can double check and you know work that into the signature. But what that means is that if a user is on a phishing website, the security key will simply refuse to work. Um, and, and that was kind of like the breakthrough here. It's like a lot of technology so far um, focused on providing some kind of a proof back to the server, but it relied on the user's cognitive ability to, to double check and make sure they're not getting fished. Uh, and we know that doesn't really work. So Fido introduced this concept of like, hey, can we make it the technology's problem and not the user's problem to figure out if you're actively getting fished? And turns out, yeah, we can successfully do that. And everything else that builds on top of Fido and builds on top of U2F has these properties that essentially, yes, it authenticates the user, but it also kind of like authenticates the website to the authenticator. And that's really what makes this resistant against phishing. So we had that. And, and the very next piece that we added, um, and that happened after 2018 really, is the capability to use the built-in platform authenticators inside of these devices um, through WebAuthn as well. Now, what does this mean? This means that if you have an app or you, know, you have a website, you're able to do that um, what we call like re-authentication. You're able to do re-auth, um, not only you know, asking for the user to type a password, but you're also using, are able to use the built-in authenticator on the device. So essentially this is the technology that the iPhone 5S pioneered with Touch ID about eight years ago, right? Uh, we have this ability uh, inside of our iPhone. Um, we had that for a long time where I install an app. Let's say it's my bank app. My bank asked me to enter my username and my password. Maybe they sent me a second factor. Once I've authenticated, at that point in time, they now create like either they create a key pair or they put some kind of like a, uh, you know, some shared secret on, 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 the, on, on the device itself. And then next time I come back to the app, I can prove that it's still me by just touching my fingerprint on a sensor. Um, and, and it's not really a password replacement. It's kind of like a password alternative. I can always fall back to the password if I want to. If my finger is wet or I don't want to go through the process, I can cancel out of the biometric prompt and I can go back to using, you know, the traditional um, username and password. But it's a shortcut. And it's it, it, it was great in, in kind of like um, legitimizing the biometric technology and kind of like commoditizing it for general use. And that's really what kicked off this whole process where there was iPhone with 5S, Android came. Uh, we had those in, in those devices, but it was still very, very limited and still only really applicable to applications running on these devices. What we've seen lately is that, you know, through W3C, we've now also made this uh, uh, technology possible uh, for websites to enable. So if you're a website running on an, a, a mobile device, as you can see here, like we've done with Google, uh, you know, passwords of google.com, which is like a sensitive portion of the Google website, where if you go there, uh, Google will say, hey, we, we want to make sure it's really you. And we do that by issuing a FIDO, kind of like a FIDO web auth and reauth, um, where the user then has to touch their fingerprint. And it's all in the context of a website, right? This isn't an app running on the phone, it's all in a website. And of course, the moment we did that, that meant that it also started making sense to go back and put biometrics in desktop and laptop devices, which traditionally users don't really run that many apps anymore. We really interact through through websites there. So suddenly, um, you know, the the biometric kind of like mechanism and technology was 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 opened up not only for applications but also for websites to use. And of course, Fido also has capabilities that allows uh, native apps running on these devices to rather use Fido capabilities than direct biometric components on the device. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but basically what's really cool about that is you allow key stores to be shared. So if I have ABC app running on my phone and I create a key pair there and I then go to abc.com, the website on my phone, those two 
uh, kind of like context or, or those two applications or services kind of share the same context. So a key created in the one can be can be accessed in the other one, which means if I create a key over here without using a username and a password, I can then use the key in the other context. So that's kind of like, you know, part, part of the power of FIDO. But essentially, you want to think about it kind of at the basic level. We've allowed biometric capabilities and built-in authenticators on these devices to be accessible or made accessible through the website. Uh, and not only not only through through applications. And we've seen a number of RPs or relying parties adopt this over the years. Uh, PayPal, eBay, Yahoo Japan, NTD Docomo, a couple, Google. Uh, if you go to passwords at Google.com on Android phone, you can see this in action. But remember, it didn't really change the security model all that much, right? It 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 simply added a convenient way to re-authenticate, but users would still fall back to passwords whenever the context changed. Like for example, if I go from one phone to another one, I upgrade my phone, or I lose my old phone and I get a new phone. You know, at, at kind of like step zero on that new device, I'd still be falling back to a username and a password to get back into the service. And that's really what we're trying to address here uh, with, with kind of the next steps in, 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 in FIDO and in WebAuthn is how do we actually move beyond falling back to passwords every time something changes? And how do we sustain being in a passwordless world? Um, and basically, this is kind of like what I just said, right? Or no closer to, to getting rid of passwords. Truly, every time you get to a new device, you have to do it again. And, and if you kind of think about this, there were still three major problems. At the point in time where we ended up with FIDO um, WebAuthn specification or W3C WebAuthn level two, we still ended up with three distinct problems that, that needed solving. And these three problems were the first one being what happens to your FIDO credentials that you create on a device? when you change that device, right? Let's say I have a phone and I have 50 apps on the phone and 30 websites that I've interacted with. And I've created a bunch of credentials on these devices or this particular device over the years. Now I upgrade my phone or, or, or I lose my device and I get a new one. What happens to all the FIDO credentials? And if we say they're all gonna go away, what does that mean when I get my new device? First off, it's gonna be very painful because I'm gonna have to re-bootstrap into all of those services. And how am I gonna do that? Falling back to a username and a password? I mean, that's certainly not what we want. So that's the first thing that, that needs to be solved. The second problem that we're running into is if I have a phone and my phone has all of my FIDO credentials because I've been interacting with many different services over the years on this device, um, what happens when I try and access a service from a different device? Like, let's imagine I'm logging into my bank on my phone. I've got a FIDO credential. Everything works great. Tomorrow I go to my laptop and I want to log into my bank there also. What happens? Traditionally, today, I'd need a username and a password on the laptop or on the desktop, right? And then maybe I'd still need to pull out my phone because my bank wants to send me an SMS OTP to the phone. How do we solve that problem with FIDO so that we get rid of the SMS OTPs and we also get rid of the username and the password entry? So that's kind of the second question. And then the third problem, which is more of a UX issue, is what happens when a user tries to interact with FIDO uh, and how is that, how is that how that process kicked off, right? If I go to a website today, I usually see a username field and I see a password field. Instinctively, users know what to do. They should enter their username and their password or password managers instinctively know what to do. It'll suggest the username and password that I saved for this particular website. So users don't need a lot of training there because they understand when they see these two boxes, that's what's need to go in, into them. Um, when we're dealing with FIDO, there is no boxes, right? There is maybe a button that says log in with FIDO or click here to log in with FIDO or whatever the terminology is. Um, but you know, at what point do we show the user that button? And at what point do we show users username and password prompts? Or do we show them both? Um, and, and, and that was a tricky problem for us to solve because many websites, think of Google, for example, as we're starting to transition into the world of FIDO, we can't just change our website unilaterally to put a login with FIDO button there because not a lot of users will have FIDO credentials and they're only clicking the button and then some error would be thrown. Um, so, so how do we kind of like solve that and only really guide the user to FIDO if we know they have a reasonable chance of succeeding and guide the user towards usernames and passwords if we know that's still what they're using. So that's kind of a little bit of a problem and, and we're going to be talking about how we're thinking about solving these um, as, as kind of like an industry here today. So why don't we jump in? Uh, let's take the first problem first. So the first issue is what would happen to your FIDO credentials if you change your phone? Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this in the past. What should we be doing? How should we be treating this? Like, can FIDO credentials actually leave a device and be sent over to another one? In the end state, 
we've kind of decided that you know maybe maybe that's just what users want to have happen um and and we can kind of like illustrate that through uh, eliza here eliza is trying to uh, you know um i guess use fido on a device that she owns she's got an android phone today um and our thinking here is we will allow, allow Eliza to turn off FIDO synchronization on her devices, which basically would allow her to back up her FIDO credentials in the cloud. Um, and, and today, with kind of like where crypto technology and end-to-end -end encryption is, we can allow Eliza to back up her credentials in a cloud, like in a Google cloud, without needing the data to kind of reside in, 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 in an, in an unencrypted or in a, in a decryptable form on, on in, inside of the cloud. So the thinking here is like, even though I might have some credentials on my phone, um, those credentials can be stored on Google's end, but it can be encrypted with a secret that only Eliza knows, which means that even though the credentials are stored somewhere else, no one actually has access to those credentials except for Eliza. Now that might sound kind of like a bit of a chicken egg problem because if you lose all your devices, how will you prove you can still access that cloud account if you don't want to use a password. So the thinking that we have around that is like, you know, why don't we tie some of this in with the screen lock, right? Today, if you use a phone, chances are you have a screen lock set up on it, either a pin pattern password, if you're using an Android phone, yes, you might also have a biometric, but every now and again, you're still asked for the pin pattern password. So we know that's something users remember. If we were able to do an encrypt kind of like all your FIDO credentials in a way locally and then upload them to the cloud in a way that they can only be decrypted if this local screen lock is known, that could allow us to very, very securely and very safely store these credentials without having to rely on like a password per se to decrypt. Now, obviously we'll know kind of like this is, you know, lower entropy than a long password. So we can't only allow access to these credentials using something like a screen lock. Uh, so you're probably also going to have to prove possession of something else, like maybe proof possession of a SIM card, or maybe proof possession of a phone number. Like there will have to be something else added, you know, proof possession of an email account uh, that you own somewhere else. But that plus knowing this kind of like local screen lock might give us enough confidence in order to allow us to restore your Friday credentials back onto your, onto your new device, kind of like get that state back. And that would allow us to go from a place where you have a bunch of apps, you've upgraded the credentials into FIDO, we're all using FIDO on this, these devices now. Um, when you lose your device or you upgrade to a new one, that state comes back. So the moment you open an application on your new phone, FIDO is already there, the credentials are already available, you simply unlock, you know, show your face, touch your finger, do your screen lock, and, and you, get, you get access to that account straight away. Um, this is kind of critical. And, and, and the reason why we think this is critical is because this is how users are trained to think about password managers today, right? If I have a password manager, there's no point if that the passwords that this password manager saves only resides on my local machine. Um, the benefit of password managers is that these credentials are synced, right? They're everywhere I would need them. And, and we need to kind of do the same thing with FIDO credentials. If we don't, we, we risk taking a step backwards and we risk getting this technology uh, to a point where it really won't be mass adopted because it's just not convenient enough. So although we're giving up something here by saying the credentials aren't held only locally anymore, there will be some synchronization here. Of course, users can turn it off if they want to, but just like with password managers. But the thinking is, if you allow these credentials to be synced and we'll allow them to be synced in a, in a secure, in a sane way, um, we're able to solve this life cycle problem where from one device to another device, these credentials can kind of like be, be transferred and, and become usable over, over a lo longer period of time than just the, uh, the, the, the usable time of, of, of the usable lifetime of, of a single device. So we really think that is critical and we're kind of taking a page out of a password manager playbook here um, for, for, for thinking about solving that problem. Okay, so that is lifecycle management and credential synchronization or credential backup. Um, the second problem we wanted to look at here is how would you access FIDO credentials um, between devices, cross device, right? I have FIDO credentials on my phone um, and I'm trying to sign in to a service on my laptop. And my laptop and my phone are physically close to one another, but there is nothing else that's really shared here. Um, how can my laptop access credentials on my phone? And of course, here we're depicting like a MacBook and an iPhone, but it could just have well have been a Windows machine and an Android phone or a MacBook and an Android phone, right? So, so completely cross device, how can we allow FIDO credentials to be used from one device to another? Um, and of course, in, in, in kind of like keeping in mind FIDO principles, 
One of the reasons for FIDO phishing resistance is the fact that your authenticator and your client, so in other words, your browser and your physical security key are always locally attached. If you think about a physical security key, there is a USB transport. You're attaching your security key physically with USB into your machine. That's how we make sure that these two things are local and that there is no one in the middle. Um, the same thing applies here. We can't really just send data through the cloud from the phone to the laptop because typically that will open up holes again uh, from, from, a, from a phishing resistance perspective, right? You might actually be connecting the phone to the wrong laptop. There might be someone in the middle. So it's very, very important that, that there's some semblance of like local proximity between these two devices. Um, we can't really force users to um, you know, use cables to connect their phone and their laptop together. So what we've opted here for is a protocol that's available pretty much ubiquitously right now called Bluetooth. Um, and we're kind of like opting to use a version of Bluetooth, a variant of Bluetooth here to show local proximity between these two devices. So that's kind of like the thinking for us right now. Um, and again, if we look at Eliza uh, here trying to sign in, um, it might look something like this. She's on her laptop. Remember, she already, you know, created the credential on her phone at some point. We'll look at how that worked in a second. She has a credential on her phone uh, for TriBank, which is the bank she's trying to sign into. She might hit a button called sign in, like sign in with Fido or whatever, hits the button. And at that point in time, her browser tells her, hey, I think you should be linking a phone here. Um, and at that point in time, she grabs her phone, opens the quick settings menu, might hit the Fido login button down below. Um, that might open a QR code scanner, take the phone, scan the QR code um, that's presented on the browser, and this allows the phone and the, and, the, um, and the laptop to find each other over Bluetooth. So these two are now kind of like, we, we call them linked. It's kind of like a pairing process, but I don't want to call it pairing because we're not really Bluetooth pairing these two together. We're kind of doing pairing at the application layer. So kind of like linking these two together. And once you've linked them, then we can now tell the user, hey, on your old phone, do you want to approve this login from the laptop? Uh, Eliza touches her fingerprint to say yes, and once she's done that, she's immediately signed into her banking website. So think of that very much the same way as you think about the physical security key that you inserted into your USB port. The only difference is there's no physical connection. We're using Bluetooth, so we need the QR code scanning for the right laptop to find the right phone, and then we're using Bluetooth for the proximity piece to make sure these two things are in physical proximity, which immediately uh, kind of like makes this as robust against phishing as, as physical security key. So that's kind of the important part here. So how did this work? Well, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, there is the um, WebAuthn kind of like construct here, the API, navigator.credentials.get that you issue. Uh, you pass in some challenge, you pass in some RPID, um, and you set what we call user verification to require. And that's what made that fingerprint pop up on the phone appear. So it says, hey, you need to touch your fingerprint. You touch your fingerprint, and at that point in time, you're signed in. Um, there is uh, kind of like um, a question here around the user verification, whether we want to set it to required or whether we want to set it to preferred. Um, if the user isn't using a screen lock on their phone, we might still want this um, this this uh, mechanism to pause. So we might want to set uh, different parameters here, but, but we have a document which I'll reference towards the end of the talk here that goes into that in much more detail and, 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 and kind of like goes through the various nuances of, of how you set these different parameters. But I wanted to kind of give an idea for how simple this really is to use from the website's perspective. It's really pretty, pretty trivial. Uh, you pause in a couple of parameters and at that point, you know, it, it just works. So let's quickly take a detour. Uh, remember I said earlier, like the user Eliza was on her laptop and she tried to log in using credentials on the phone. But how did the credentials get on the phone in the first place, right? Let's quickly look at that for just a couple of minutes here. So the credentials on the phone got created through a very, very standard process that we're all pretty you know, used to by now. Um, if I open my bank app, my banking app on my phone on day one, the first thing it's going to ask me is to enter some credentials, like maybe a username and a password. Uh, and in this particular example, Eliza is on the TriBank website. Doesn't really matter for FIDO, whether it's an app or the web, they're kind of like, you know, interchangeable. So we're on TriBank's website here and Eliza hit sign in on day one. And at that point, Eliza was asked to enter a username and a password. Now, because she has her username and password saved in her password manager on Android, she can just click on it. So she clicks the button and it autofills the username, it autofills the password, and at that point she signed in. But then we get a promo. And this promo we're all pretty used to, you know, on, on phones, we see this all the time. Your application might say, hey, it's great that you logged in using a username and a password, but next time, do you just want to use biometrics? And then the user would say yes. And at that point in time, saying yes is actually the impetus for creating that FIDO credential on the device. So now next time, next time that you come back to this website or this app on the same device, 
you're not going to be typing usernames and passwords. You're simply going to be using, you know, whatever local authenticator is built in, biometric or screen lock or whatever the case is. But the credential is not only accessible on the device, the credential is also accessible cross device using this cable transport or this mechanism that we spoke about earlier. I haven't really kind of defined that term yet. Um, the, the mechanism that we're using whereby um, a phone and a laptop can communicate to each other over Bluetooth, we kind of call that protocol cable, um, but it's not using a cable, kind of like a bit tongue in cheek. It's, it stands for cloud assisted BLE, so cloud assisted Bluetooth low energy. That's what the protocol stands for, uh, or the naming. And that's the mechanism that we use to access credentials. So in this future world, FIDO credentials are accessible on the same device by any context, whether it's an app or the web, they can access the same credentials. And they're also accessible over the remote uh, kind of like uh, construct where we use cable, where any other device can ask the phone, hey, do you happen to have credentials for TriBank? Of course, not anyone can ask for it. You need to perform the linking process first. But once linking is performed using that QR code, then at that point in time, um, the 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 uh, the device, you know, your laptop or desktop is free to ask the phone for a signature. The user will still have to actively say yes on the device, and once they do it, the signature is released over over Bluetooth, and then the laptop can use it to sign in. So that's kind of like complete life cycle how the process works from from start to finish here. And then how did we make that credential that we just showed? That's a little bit more involved than the get call navigator.credentials.create. Uh, we pass in a bunch of like details here. Uh, you know, you can pass in a username. We can talk about later. You know what that would mean, and you need to pass in a challenge. You need to say the uh, or set the public key credential parameters, uh, and then the 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 two that's most important. Again, I've kind of commented on them here. Is the authenticator attachment and the user verification. Again, we want to say that this credential should be created locally on the device. We're not interested in creating a credential on a physical, you know, removable key. We're going to create it on the platform, and secondly we want the device to be able to authenticate the user at the point in time when authentication is needed and that's again why we said this user verification required and again there's a little asterisk here later in the uh, in the presentation i'll talk about a document that kind of goes through all the details here and when when you might set it to required and when you might set it to preferred so the last thing i want to quickly touch on um in in this deck is kind of the very last issue that we ran into um which is one which has a lot to do about the user, user experience here, right? What do we do when a website wants to start using FIDO, but we know not a whole lot of users are going to have FIDO credentials at that point in time? Should we just render a button like you've seen easy, earlier in my deck where we have instead of a username and a password, or instead of a login button, we have a login with FIDO that the user clicks? Uh, we know from experience that a whole lot of users are going to click that new button. And if they don't have credentials, they're going to have a bad time. So. Some of the thinking before was like, you know, should we really offer a silent API to uh, websites or developers where they can kind of like poll the system and say, hey, silently, device, do you have any FIDO credentials for my website? And if true gets returned, then the website would know what type of UX to render. I mean, theoretically, that makes sense. But the problem is that's not really very privacy forward because that will allow um, a developer to kind of like silently prompt whether FIDO credentials exist on a platform. Uh, and that's not really the, the, the right uh, privacy properties we think that, that we want for, for FIDO. Um, so we were kind of like stuck here a little bit. And we're like, well, how do we, how do we convey the right UX to the user um, if we don't want to just silently you know, leak certain pieces of information, like whether FIDO credentials exist or not to, to do a website? And then kind of the thinking was like, oh, you know what? We have something acting on the user's behalf, running on their device. Can't we use that? And that typically is the user agent or the browser. So we decided uh, to take a page from the playbook of password managers. And in a couple of slides, you'll see how that kind of like, you know, how where, where we ended up with that. But first off, we were like, ah, you know, maybe we should just like add a button. Let's just add a login with FIDO button to a website. Um, the problem is most websites nowadays look something like this. So there's literally a lot of buttons. And then there is a or use your email address. And you know, this gets pretty tricky. For users, like, you know, I can't remember whether I use the login with one of these like social logins or whether I use the password, like an, an, an explicit username. And then if you add another button in there, things just become more complicated. And login with FIDO isn't really federation. So you know, it, it wouldn't kind of like set the right tone here. So for us, we really didn't want to end up in, in a world like this. Um, so we kind of like thought a little bit about the problem. And where we ended up in the end was with something that 
acts and looks and feels a lot like a password manager. So today, if you hit sign in uh, on, a, on a particular website, you get rendered a username prompt, even though we know in most cases the user would not be entering a username manually, right? The moment they click into the field, we're going to come up and say, hey, we think we've got three usernames for you here that you can use. Do you want to use one of these? So what if we kind of like plumb the FIDO credential store into the password manager UX to give you something like this? When the user clicks into that field, we'll go and look. Do we happen to have any FIDO credentials for this user locally on the machine? Or in this case, do we even happen to have any FIDO credentials for this user on local phones that's linked to the device? In this case, that's what we show up here. We're like, hey, we don't have any locally saved usernames for you. We don't have any local FIDO credentials, but we have one on a phone that we know is nearby that you've linked previously to this machine. Do you want to use that? And then all Eliza has to do is click on that particular credential. She'll get a buzz on the phone, get the phone, touch the fingerprint, and at that point, she signed it. So at this point, websites now have a choice. They can go with this UI on the left that looks and feels a lot like Password Manager UI, and we typically kind of like call that the FIDO conditional UI, or you can still have the physical button if you want it. And over time, as less and less reliance, or, or, or and less kind of we have less and less reliance on entering physical usernames and passwords, we might move to a world where you just have a button where you click and you sign in and it's magic and everything works. But at least for the next couple of years, as we're trying to move to that world, it probably makes sense for us to take a bit of a more nuanced approach and, and kind of like help the user get there uh, with some kind of like hinted UI or, or conditional UI as we've been talking about here. And kind of the, the way that this would work as well, you know, on the right hand side, if you just want the button, it's easy, right? You just make a WebAuthn get call. You said you need to require the no allow list, and we'll look at that in a second. That's trivial. On the left hand side, if you want the more kind of like the, the mediated UI, um, first you'll need to check if the browser supports mediation. Uh, you know, then you include this username WebAuthn kind of like auto, uh, auto complete attribute. Um, and then when you make a WebAuthn call, you'll set it with mediation to conditional uh, to tell the system like, hey, I'm expecting FIDO here if it's available, but if not, I'm still happily, you know, or I'm still happy to accept like a, a manual username and a password uh, in, in point here as well. Um, so that's kind of like in a high level how this works. Some of the stuff is already in Chrome Canary. You can play around with it by turning on flags, happy to kind of like answer questions, although I know we won't be doing uh, Q and A here today. Uh, my email address is on the slide, and uh, my DMs are open too. So if you're interested in kind of getting in contact with me there, uh, feel feel free to to reach out. But essentially, the way that this would work, just as I've explained in words on the previous slide, you just do a get call, very similar to what we've done earlier in the deck. Uh, again, set the challenge, set the RPID, use the verification to require it, but you set mediation to conditional. Uh, and at that point in time, this kind of like, and then of course you tag the autocomplete field, as, as we said, but at that point in time, you'll actually get a little pop rendered pop-up that will appear if credentials are found locally on the system, which can guide the user to using the FIDO credential. There will also be some kind of resolution management where if there's two credentials, one password and, and one WebAuthn uh, for the same account, we probably will prefer the WebAuthn one, so we won't show the password one. So a little bit of management there uh, that makes things a little easier for the user too, uh, but that'll be taken care of by the by the various platform uh, vendors, you know, or browser vendors, um, kind of like, like on their own. So, you know, in summary, um, we think FIDO is ready for deployment today, but it doesn't really enable yet the full lifecycle passwordless experiences for general use cases that we want uh, to have uh, in kind of like a sustainable way, right? Where users can use uh, passwords today, move over to FIDO, WebAuthn, and then never have to deal with passwords ever again. Like today, there are still going to be some points in time where users will have to fall back. And it's those gaps that we're working on addressing right now. You can kind of like think of this as like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like right at the bottom, we have to have the basics and get the basics in place for the technology to work. Yes, it has to be phishing resistant. Yes, we need to get kind of like that, those basics, credential stores, authenticators on the platforms, all those things working. Now we're actually kind of at the higher la layers where we're working on like UX enhancements, you know, how do you do the cross device stuff? And then how do you just not deal with credentials uh, you know, ever again have to reestablish them when you move from device to device. It's kind of like those those higher level needs that, that we're addressing right now. Um, and, and most of these things, I would say, is roughly, you know, without committing to anything here, but mostly between 12 and 18 months away uh, is, is when you'll start to see these things like land, where there's kind of like end-to-end -end experiences for users to use uh, and then for developers to actually, you know, lean into and say, hey, if I start a new service today, I probably don't even have to include support for usernames and passwords any longer because FIDO and WebAuthn is such a complete end-to-end -end kind of like full lifecycle uh, um, product that, that 
I, I really don't need anything else. And that's really where we want to get you, in, you know, towards the end of 2022 and, and into 2023. So kind of next steps, if you're interested in kind of learning a little bit more here, uh, check out IBM's FIDO server. They really put together a very, very cool kind of like proof of concept server that implements um, most of the guidance in the document that's in the then section, uh, the perusing and contributing to this um, how to FIDO document on GitHub. We're also working on kind of like a future version of that that will be published soon. Uh, we'll link it from that same URL, so you'll be able to kind of like interact with that and see it. Uh, also, we're, we'd love to take contributions and feel free to have, you know, reach out with any comments or, or any suggestions or additions you have. But you can kind of like look at the document there, uh, which is a lot easier to read than the FIDO specification, but it kind of like talks you through how to enable all these use cases we looked at. Um, and then you can test them all out on, on IBM's kind of like POC server, which is pretty cool. And lastly, if you're interested, uh, go and play around with the code lab that we've got going um, at, at codelabs.developers.google.com. And there's two there, one for Android and, and, and one, for, one for the web. Um, so those, I think, are probably the, the easiest ways to get started um, with, with kind of like these, these, these ideas. And, and with that, I, I hope you enjoyed the talk here. I'm sorry that I couldn't, you know, see you all in person this year, but I'm really rooting for 2022 and hoping I can see folks in person again and start interacting uh, next year, hopefully in, in Vegas. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.